Hey there, all you cool cats and kittens. This is Lee Hoy with KBRD bringing you the latest in contemporary music. Let's go. Everybody's been sitting at home way too long. I know you guys are ready to have some fun. Macklemore is going to get us cranked up and get ready to get started with this webinar today where we're going to talk about death marches, tobacco trees, and windmills. All right, I know enough of that tomfoolery. Hold on. We'll put Macklemore on pause over here. How's everybody doing today? Everybody good? Who all's in the room now, man? We should be having a pretty good crowd tonight. Hope everybody's doing well. My name is Lee Hoy. I am a uh, photography instructor, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And I am going to introduce you a little bit to what you're seeing on your screen. Up at the upper right, you're going to see a column that's going to have chat, Q&A, and polls. If you click on the polls up there on the upper right, I've got a little poll open and going where I'm asking, have you ever birded in Big Bend National Park before? I'll be looking forward to y'all's responses. How's everybody doing there, guys? I see a lot of y'all. Some I know, some I don't. So I hope tonight we're going to have a really good time. We're going to talk about birding in Big Bend National Park. I want to, again, remind you up here is the chat. There's also a QA. and a um, You can be uh, on, on the Q&A or in the chat. You're welcome to throw up some uh, questions if you like. I'll try to see them. I'll try to get to them. But there's a lot of people tonight, and it scrolls pretty quickly. So hope everybody's doing well. And uh, I do want to know if you if you ask questions and I don't get to them, I will give you some contact information at the end where you can also send me questions uh, later on. Man, I see Boston Mass, Houston, and Port O'Connor. Yeah, if you want to throw up there where you're from, that'd be kind of interesting to share with everyone um, where your home is. And uh, But again, get familiar with what's on the right, the chat, the poll. I have a poll open in there. Hopefully you can uh, answer that real quick. Uh, if you're not hearing me, my screen is telling me that I have input. So you might have your sound uh, muted. Be sure and check uh, that you, you your mics are muted. You can't talk. Oh, New Jersey. Houston, Sweetwater. Um, so make sure you don't have your your output, your speakers muted, because I can see that I've got sound coming right now. So um, that should Ohio, Maryland, Gainesville, Florida. All right. Kentucky, Maine. Look at there. We got a lot of folks from all over. This is great. Well, welcome, guys. Good evening. Again, my name is Lee Hoy. If you just came in a little bit late, just getting started with us. And I am up here on top of in my home on top of a mountain in the Davis Mountains. So coming to you from uh, about as socially distant as a human being can be. Um, I don't see or hear a human being unless I come down from my house. So having said that, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get us started on our little presentation tonight. Death marches, tobacco trees, and windmills birding in Big Bend National Park. Oh, see, I see Sierra Vista, Arizona. What a great spot. Um, the, the picture you see there, that's the Chisos Mountains. That is what Big Bend National Park is well known for. It is uh, a mountain. It is the only mountain range, I believe, that is completely enclosed within the boundaries of a national park. So that's kind of special. Uh, Big Bend is also known for having had more bird species recorded than any other national park. But it's also had more ants, more bees, more scorpions, more cactus. Uh, we have tremendous biodiversity out here. It's one of the reasons I chose to make my home out here. And I am very blessed to get to live and bird in such a beautiful area. So having said that, I want to introduce you a little bit. Uh, of course, this is a Wildside Nature Tour uh, webinar put on uh, by Wildside, whom I am a photography workshop instructor. I don't do birding tours for them. I just do photography tours. I do both domestic and internationally. I'll tell you about that a little later. I own Big Bend Birding and Photo Tours, where I'm the owner and primary guide. I specialize in birding and photography tours and workshops in the Big Bend National Park area. I got started as a little nerd birder, and I'll tell you about that in Big Bend here in just a minute. But uh, a little bit about where I live. On the left, uh, you see a picture of of my home, that's in uh, September when the Milky Way is more vertical. That's my little home up here on the mountain. And uh, that is the Milky Way. And I just walked out the front door, took that shot one night. The picture on the right that you see, that is the view from the west side of my front deck, looking out over the mountains. Mount Livermore is off in the distance. That's the tallest peak in the Davis Mountains. Needless to say, get some pretty cool birds up here too. Um, I know here shortly I'll be hearing black chin sparrow calling in my yard. Scott's Orioles are around, uh, paddock tanager, 
Canyon towhee, which is a special bird for me. I get seven to eight species of hummers in the fall. And uh, that's kind of low for our neighborhood down in the in the valleys. They get up to 10 or 11. So a um, little special place. So I get to kind of look out uh, to the east on my porch where I'm sitting right now. If I look out, I see the McDonald Observatory. You see it in a couple of pictures there. I live at 6,431 feet up in the Davis Mountains. I don't have to have air conditioning in my house in Texas. And there are not many people that can say that uh, for sure. So uh, you see the mountains there with some nice hoar frost on them. So I get to live in a very beautiful birdie spot as well. And uh, But uh, today's presentation will focus on Big Bend National Park. Curious to see if any of y'all have answered the poll yet. Oh, wow, cool. So, so far, 14 of you no, five of you yes. I know we had a lot more people registered. So if you haven't filled out the poll there, please click on the top on poll and, and uh, throw your answer up there for me. So. I'm going to orient you a little bit to Big Bend National Park, and I, th this map may be small on your screen, depending on what you're viewing this with, but it's okay, because I'm just going to kind of give you some general, uh, a general feel for the park as a whole. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is up here at the north side, oh, you know what, I don't think I have, uh, someone answer me, can you see my, uh, can you see my mouse moving? I think I need to turn that on. Uh, can you guys see my mouse moving there? Someone throw me up an answer real quick. I don't remember if it lets you see my mouse or not, but um, no. Okay. Uh, not seeing any answers yet. No. Okay. No, cannot see my mouse. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I can. Oh, look at there. See, you can see that, can't you? Ah, very cool. So this is the Northeast entrance of the park that I'm circling right there. That is Persimmon Gap, okay? I don't know, can you guys see the uh, black circle I just painted now up at the top of the map? Yep, okay, cool. So this black circle up at the top, this is going to be the north, what I refer to as the north or eastern entrance to the park at Persimmon Gap. There is hardly any birding in this area, so we won't be talking about that much yet. This over here is the west entrance to, there's my beautiful W, look at that. Uh, it kind of looks like uh, my rear on a bad day, more likely. Um, but this is the west entrance to the park. This comes through Studio Butte Terlingua, which many of you may have heard about. Okay, Panther Junction right here. This is the main visitor center for the park. Uh, there is some birding there in the parking lot area, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. Oh, my favorite, the Chisos Basin. This is heaven. This is about 5,000 feet in elevation. Uh, it's where you have to start the hike for the Kalima Warbler that we're going to talk about in a little bit. And this is one of the absolute don't miss areas of birding in the park. Uh, down here is Rio Grande Village and Daniel's Ranch. We will be talking about that. This is another hot spot along the river with the cottonwood trees and the riparian uh, corridor. Castellon Camp Campground. Uh, we'll talk about this is the only the easternmost location to see Lucy's Warbler nesting in the U.S., uh, those are uh, the main spots. Dugout Wells is a little lesser hot spot. Sam Nail Ranch right over here on the Ross Maxwell Scenic Drive. So we're going to be looking at these areas. This along here, you'll see this is the Rio Grande River. So we have Mexico over here. Uh, we have Alpine and Marathon further north. Black Gap Wildlife Management Area over here. Uh, there's a big private ranch too down here on the east side. And then if you go a little further west, this way you'll get to Big Bend Ranch State Park, which is uh, a very remote state park. So this is where the Chisos Mounds will be found too, right here. And that's where we're gonna spend some of our time today. So um, let me tell you a little bit about my history with Big Bend National Park. My first trip to the park was in August of 1988. My grandparents had bought me a camera. I was, I believe I was 18, uh, 19, 19. Uh, and uh, taking me to the park for the first time, I, I had a very broad range of wildlife knowledge, very interested in wildlife from an early age, but I didn't know specific bird species. I could tell you red-tailed hawk and house sparrow and a few other kind of, you know, very common type birds, blue jays, robins, cardinals. But they had bought me a, a camera and I was in the Chisos Basin and I see this very large kind of, to a lot of people, dull to me, beautiful bird. And I took a photo of it, a horrible photo that you will not see tonight. But I thought, my gosh, that looks like a sparrow on steroids. 
And my grandparents, I was one of only two grandchildren on either side. I was what we know in the business as a spoiled turd, uh, which is a great way to grow up as a grandchild. Not so great to be as an adult when you have to work out of that. But I, I took a photo and I thought, well, if I'm going to take pictures of something, I would sure like to be able to identify and know what they are. And I said, in duly spooled grandchild fashion, Mimi Papa, please buy me this National Geographic Field Guide which they dutifully did being the uh, kind of grandparents that they should be. So I um, got the book and I started looking. I was immediately impressed with the number of birds that were only found in Big Bend or only in the southwestern part of the U.S. And were really, it kind of caught my attention. I, I was, even then, white-winged doves, that was a special thing to see in that area. Black Gap Wildlife Management Area had been established for the hunting of white-winged doves. And because they were just so limited and it was kind of a special thing to get to go do. So um, I, I really kind of immediately started getting fascinated. But for several years, I only birded with my camera. I had no binoculars. The very next year, a professor of mine, while I was working on my undergraduate degree in geography, which I have a BA in geography, a master of science in regional city planning, and a master's of divinity with biblical languages, all very useful for photography. Um, actually, they are in many ways. My professor came to me and said, Lee, I need an undergraduate student to help me with a vegetative map of Big Bend National Park. And I was like, oh, oh that's me. That's me. He goes, hold on, hold on. He goes, we have to hike every trail and drive every road. And I'm like, oh, yes, yes, yes. He goes, hold on, hold on. I can't pay you much. And I thought, oh, my God, I was going to do it for free. This is great. So I actually got paid um, to uh, go on every trail backpack, hike, day hike, and drive every road and conduct a vegetative map survey of Big Bend National Park, which made me fall in love with the park even that much more. I eventually won a pair of binoculars in a Oklahoma City Zoo photography contest. And um, from 1990 until 2015, I came out numerous times, usually late May, um, or early June, August, and winter were the primary times I came out, uh, just because that, those are some of my favorite seasons. Uh, people ask me why summer is my favorite. The birds are more active. The summer storms are spectacular. The bears are more active. There's fewer people in the park. The sun sets in the window in the basin. You'll see a, a picture of the basin in the window. The galactic center of the Milky Way is very visible, and there's a fewer visitors in the park. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's so hot. My, meanwhile, in Texas, the rest of Texas, it's humid. Everybody's staying inside. Out here, I love summer. I hated summer in Central Texas where I lived before, but I love summer. I moved to Sanderson, which is just east of the park in November 2015, and then finally relocated here to the Davis Mountains in 2018 and started doing the guiding full time. I'd been doing it part time off and on for a very long time, but finally said, you know what? I'm ready to quit working for other people and ready to do what I love doing every day. Uh, here's some old photos of me in the park. Uh, the, the photo up here in the upper left, uh, that is uh, standing on top of Emory Peak. That is the highest point in the park and uh, a, an incredible 360 degree view from up there. Uh, here I am back uh, along the boot camp, I'm sorry, on the uh, Pinnacles Pass Trail, the trail we hike up to uh, start our Kalima hike. And then uh, getting to see some sexy leg over here. I am back on the southwest rim. That's about a 1,500-foot drop. Peregrine's nest uh, down the way, and so sometimes they'll fly by. Red-tailed hawks soaring along at eye level. Uh, it's where I love having lunch uh, on some trips. I don't take normally birders back there because that area is not as great for birding as some other areas. But So those are a couple of photos of yours truly a little uh, few years back uh, there in Big Bend. So let me first share with you some tips for birding in the park. Much of the, this is a huge park, over 880,000 acres. Much of the habitat in the park is fairly consistent, okay? You can stop along the road and you are generally going to see the same 8 to 15 species of birds the whole time. Uh, occasionally, like in winter migration, you might catch something a little different. I've had a great flycatcher in the very consistent habitat. And this habitat is anywhere from creosote, lechuguilla, okatilla, you know, you, you get this kind of, you get these uh, patterns of vegetation and you're going to see cactus wrens, mockingbirds, occasionally a crystal thrasher. That is one little different that you have to hunt for. Uh, but, but the bird life is pretty consistent there and you can waste a lot of time 
just stopping along the road trying to find that bird that you're going to see in other areas, okay? Number two, I have so many clients that get discouraged when there's a little rain, and rain out here is not normally socked in. It is storms that are in a little area, and it move, tends to move on very quickly. In the desert, when the rain stops, the birds lose their mind. They get very active, okay? So rain is a great thing. Man, just be patient. Go to where it stopped, already moved through, and the birds are going to be singing, moving, active. It's going to be wonderful bird. You have to be patient. Some birds are only found in a specific location within the park. I'm going to talk about the Lucy's Warbler. And I generally see them better in the morning than in the afternoon. So if you can't get to cottonwood in the morning, it gets a little tougher. Number four, you if you're going to try to go to some of the off-road areas or the, the speed limit in the park is 45. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people go flying around me at 70 or whatnot. But you have to take into account the amount of time it can take just to get from the basin to Rio Grande Village. At 45 miles an hour, that's almost an hour trip. So you're spending a lot of time in transport getting to areas. So if you say, Lee, I'm coming out for a day, I can hit all the hot spots, the main hot spots in a day, but we're humping it. Uh, you know, you're not going to get to spend a whole lot of time at each area and you're spending a good deal amount of time in the car. The park does not allow the use of playbacks or recordings, no matter how bad a client begs me, no more, you just can't do it. They don't, we don't, there's no playback, there's no recordings. Um, and so be patient. Um, you'll, you'll often see the things if you're patient. Yes, you really will most likely have to make the hike if you want to see the clean or warbler. If you want to try to see one down lower, um, early to mid August, when post breeding dispersal occurs, you can find them in Pine Canyon. Still a little hike back up in there, in a, and it's a rough road getting to it. My wife got lucky. Her third time ever in the park, uh, we were standing at Lost Mine Trailhead, August post breeding dispersal. We're we're getting we're stopping there to look for bear, and uh, all of a sudden I hear it. I go, Oh my gosh, there's a clean warbler! It flies across. She sees it. She's never done the hike yet. Um, and then a bear shows up. So it was a pretty cool little time. You better take more water than you need. Out here, it's so dry. You don't sweat a lot, but you are transpiring and evaporating water much quicker than you realize to so your mouth, your nostril, your ears, your eyes. Um, I am always wearing long sleeve shirts. I'm always in summertime, particularly usually in winter, but I'll wear uh, gloves to keep the sun off my hands, long brimmed hat, long pants. The desert is no place for shorts if you want to try to see certain birds. Um, you really need to be prepared. If you keep the sun off your skin, it helps you stay cooler. If you look at, watch Nat Geo and look at the nomads who live in the desert, they are covered from head to toe. There's a reason for that. You'll just stay cooler. I hear all the time, summer, it's just too hot. Well, it is not, in my opinion. It is a spectacular time for birding. Uh, if you want to watch the common black hawk, common blackhawks feed their young uh july august is a spectacular time get down there in the morning before it gets too hot we can watch them it's a great time I, i'm telling you i love summer um you just gotta you just gotta be cautious you know you just don't want to get dehydrated uh so we're going to start out our little uh tour here of big bend national park we're going to start out at the visitor center here in the chisos basin okay uh, we are uh, right here. What you see is the lodge, the uh, Chisos Basin Visitor Center on the right. This is a good spot. The Says Phoebes are almost always hanging around right in this area. And uh, realistically, whoops, um, I moved my screen. Realistically, uh, if you can stay in the basin, it is my favorite. It is centrally located, so it makes getting to all the areas much easier. You're right there around great birds, great mammals, bears, occasionally mountain lion, gray fox, the Chisos, uh, or I'm sorry, the Carmen white-tailed deer, a subspecies of white-tailed deer come through here. Um, I know a little secret spot to look for Texas antelope, squirrel. Uh, you'll get rock squirrels and other unique mammals in this area as well. So if you can stay in the lodge, if you're planning to come, at the busy times of year, and busy is generally, you know, uh, October through um, you know, October through really um, middle of May, maybe. Uh, you better book well in advance or get lucky if you want to stay in the lodge. There is a campground there, no hookups. Uh, the a couple of spots I think allow generators, but um, there's no. The only hookups are at the Rio Grande Village that we'll talk about in a minute. So again, I'm going to orient you here on our map. We are going to be looking right here 
at the base, okay? Even smaller, it really covers a much smaller area. Uh, you, have, you have to drive up Green Gulch Road, which is my favorite road in Texas, to get into the basin. As you begin to enter the oaks, the oak habitat, you know, the mixed oak and, uh, uh, you know, juniper pine trees, that's where things like Mexican jays and other birds will begin to appear, Mexican whippoorwill, things like that. Uh, so some of the birds of the basin, hepatic tanager. Oftentimes, a little earlier in uh, spring, early summer, hepatic tanager, a male will come to the restaurant there at the lodge and you will see the, he will be banging up against the window. He'll sit there along it and, um, you know, try to compete with the other males. So sometimes you can get your life for a paddock tanager sitting in the restaurant. I see a really good question. Uh, so I'm going to stop for a second and answer that. The, she, the, the question is, what's the nearest big city or airport? There are two. One I love, one I hate. The one I hate is Midland, Odessa. The oil boom, which obviously is slacked off now, it's just a, the town that it's not well. Oof, how do I say it nicely? My Texas uh, travel people are going to like me. It's nasty. The old guys don't take good care of that place. The, the airport's nuts. It's expensive. I love flying in and out of El Paso. The airport is small. It is great. You can walk right out to rental cars, right out the front door. Uber picks you up right at the front door. It is uh, about, it'll take you about mm, three and a half, four hours to get to the park from El Paso. You lose an hour because it's mountain time. This is central standard, but it is so much more relaxing, so much more beautiful. And uh, I'll show you the best route to drive in from El Paso as well. Yeah, Debbie, the, the hepatics there are very cool at the window at the, at the lodge. Black Chin Sparrow. Uh, you got to put in a little more effort for Black Chin by far than you have to do Black Throated. Knowing the call, which sounds like uh, I like to think of it as if you drop a ping pong ball and it goes tick, 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 tick. Uh, beautiful bird. I've often got views of them sitting right next to black throated sparrows, which is really cool. One of my favorite, one of my, I love sparrows and, and this is one of the most beautiful to have them in my yard, have my doors open, hear them singing, just tickles me to no end. Of course, one bird, a lot of people come here to see is the Mexican Jay. I know they are in Southeast Arizona to our Sierra Vista, uh, uh, folk on here, but you have to know this is a different subspecies and, and you always want to keep track of subspecies because they could be split someday. The Mexican Jay does not wander out of the basin. They stay up there, uh, up high. Sometimes I'm not backpackers feed them. I do not, but backpackers do. So they come up very close An absolutely beautiful bird. I love them. You often hear them before you see them, but if they get quiet, they can be ridiculously stealthy. Um, and, and I really think it's one of the birds that like there's birds I see a lot and I really don't ever get tired of any, this one, it just delights me when I hear them doing their contact calls as a family group, when they're, when they're, they're forging on the ground together, love seeing them. And then of course, one of my favorite birds, the Scots Oriole. I mean, like a beautiful, big, lesser goldfinch on steroids and, and their melodic call. I bird by ear. I don't exactly love birding by ear. It's not my favorite thing. Uh, I'm much more visually dominant. But when you hear this song, and uh, man, it's one I can just sit back and listen to. It is so beautiful. And last year, I had them nesting right, I mean, literally, you know, 35 feet from the front door of, of uh, one of the units in the lodge. So beautiful bird, great to see, never get tired of. Tal, it is somewhat similar to the scrub jay, but we have a different bird out here called Woodhouse's scrub jay, and that looks a lot more like your Florida scrub jay even than than the uh, Mexican jay. Uh, they're a little grungier. They're a little, they are a little different, uh, and in a, uh, I believe, a different genus, if I remember off the top of my head. So let's take a look at our next birds of the basin. Who doesn't love woodpeckers? I mean, my gosh, their attitude, and the one in the middle is far and away – the acorn woodpecker, that, that white eye, oh my gosh, if that isn't the coolest thing, that is a female. See the black gap between the red and the white there on the, on the crown of the head. Um, on a male, the black extends all the way to the white. Uh, another bird that when I saw it in my yard, I was just tickled to have. Acorns are a bird that I really love showing people because, you know, when they fly, when they're perched, they're call, they're just such unique critter. And, um, and, and, and it's really a lot of fun. We get yellow-bellied sapsuckers in winter. Uh, we get uh, uh, red uh, um, uh, nate, uh, yeah, red nate um, that, that just 
love seeing these guys. You know, th this one's a lot more unusual in winter. But we have lots of woodpeckers out here. These are three of them in the basin at different times of year. Acorn's a resident, but always a fun bird to see. Watching the telephone poles near the lodge and in the campground is often productive for the acorn woodpeckers. Bush tit, which is, uh, I had a British client who loved to make fun of me for the way I said bush tit with my southern accent. But in winter, these guys will gather together to, um, in, in large flocks, I'll have 30 to 40 move through my yard, hit my suet and move on at a time. And they're, you know, they chatter and they're act, they're hyperactive, man. They're like us. I mean, haven't we all been stuck inside a little long? They're just like, Oh my God, I've been on quarantine my whole life. Ah, you know, and uh, active and, and the females have pale eyes. So uh, really a beautiful little bird, very active. And I found their nests on occasion. They make these long hanging nests, kind of a top entrance, really beautiful. Uh, is there a way to cast this to TV? Uh, not this. It, I can put, I'll can. i be putting this out on YouTube. I will tell you, though, that last year and this year, I've been working with some cinematographers on uh, – they, they hired me as an animal handler. I go out and scout, uh, try to find things for them. Um, we, there will be a PBS or BBC special on the wildlife of Big Ben. We're hoping it – it's going to be summer of 2021. There's still some stories need to be wrapped up. I was just talking to this, uh, might come back out here in May to do some shooting. So keep an eye out for uh, a TV special on the wildlife of Big Bend. Uh, much has been filmed, but we need to wrap up a few things. Green Toey. Oh, Patricia, you're right. This is such a spectacular bird. Crisp in plumage, you know, wintertime. Uh, get them in the basin. I also get them down in the lowlands. But uh, if you spend enough time looking in, in some of the scrubby stuff, you'll often turn up a, a green tailed toey, which, oh my gosh, just, I mean, that's one of those birds I'd love to have someone paint one for me for my house. Well, if elf owls aren't spectacular, I don't know what is. Because when you have the world's smallest owl the size of a sparrow, uh, that is something to relish. Uh, last year, uh, when we were working on the film, the, the cinematographer called me and said, Lee, I need an elf owl nest in, an in a century plant stock in a scenic location. Okay. Uh, second night, I found it. They filmed. You'll see some great footage uh, from that location. But elf owls, are, they're singing right now. They're busy. Uh, you know, they eat the centipedes out here, which are big and nasty. They eat scorpions, moths. So they're really a special little bird. In the center of the cactus wren, uh, it's always funny. A lot of people from the east who've never seen one go, are you sure that's wren? That is very big. Yes, I'm sure it's a wren. It is a big wren. Uh, those males build these massive nests in uh, tree choya. They'll build five or six a year, take the female around, show them to her. She'll pick the one she likes. I'm glad we don't have to buy homes like that for our courtship. But uh, the, the cactus wren and that little churl, 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 they do never gets old. Townsend Solitaire, usually I have a couple in winter. This winter I didn't turn one up. I, I, I was traveling a lot this winter, though. But uh, were those the guys at True Carolyn's? Uh, yes, uh, we were. We have been working at Carolyn Old's place for uh, the, the, the show, yes. Yes, Linda, they do sound like puppies. I'll tell everybody, listen for a barking puppy, and that's one of the best ways to try to uh, get to see them. Uh, Townsend Solitaires are beautiful. Wintertime, occasionally we get them up here in the Davis Mountains quite a bit, so... Um, oh, wow. In migration, of course, uh, you get them in the low areas too, but Bullock's Orioles, never get tired of seeing those. They nest in the in areas north of the park. I, I, they don't really nest in the park a lot, but I do see them moving through. Impids, oh my gosh, if you want to try to sort out the Hammonds and, and uh, some of the other impids that are migrating through at that time, uh, you know, they're usually not vocalizing. Uh, you know, Western wood peewees are easy and uh, all offside of flycatcher, but... Uh, you know, Rufus um, hummingbird, uh, much easier in fall than they are in spring. In spring, almost never, but uh, occasionally you'll turn one up, but much more common in in fall. Gray vireo, uh, you generally have to take a hike in a normal half day or uh, full day tour. I normally can't get people to gray vireo habitat. We sometimes get one, but... Uh, in, in unusual areas, but uh, you normally have to go about, uh, you know, a mile and a half, two mile hike to a few areas. There's a couple other spots a little closer, but it's not conducive to a, just a half or a full day tour even. Of course, chipping sparrows are pretty common all over the area. 
the uh, flickers, we get northern flickers up there, red shafted are out here winter time. Uh, we do have some nesting up here in the Davis Mountains. And then Rufus Crown Sparrow. Oh, I love their little calls. Um, you know, these guys are on the slopes up in the basin, so it's a really good spot to go look for them. Uh, if you could try to follow them to find a little nest on the ground, it's really fun. But I love their – they have a little dapper type, uh, you know, look with their little mustachial, submustachial stripe and that that really sharp, crisp uh, eyebrow and, and Rufus cap. So always, always like to do that. The Upper Mountains. Uh, this is where, you know, if you want to see the Kalima, you're going to have to do the hike. Uh, you, you sometimes on the Pinnacle Pass, there's one spot where I can show them to people. There are several that will call but that you often can't get a very good look at them. And I want to caution you. I often wonder how many people think they heard their life for Kalima when in fact the, the Buick's Wren out here does a call that is almost identical, except it lacks that last little bit. But it sounds very, very similar. They don't do it. The Buick's Wren don't do that call at my house. I, they don't do it down in the low areas. Right there, they do a very different call that sounds almost spot on as the beginning of the Kalima. We also have the Black Crested Titmouse up high that, that does a very unusual call that you don't hear in other parts of Texas. Uh, we David Sarkozy, who had been doing some recording of uh, bird call, bird sounds in Texas, finally got that so we could put that out there because it, you, people always say, what is that Black Crested Titmouse? Are you sure? Yes, I'm 100% sure it is. In this picture, you see boot can. Uh, I'm sorry, you see boot uh, the boot in Boot Canyon. Right here's the boot. This is the beginning of the canyon that goes up this way, where I really like to take my clients uh, to uh, to to show them the Kalima and, and a lot of other cool birds. So that's where that gets its name. So up high, you're looking right here at these trails. Here's the basin. And to get to the upper mountain area, you know, the, the trails will actually kind of take you more like this. But uh, uh, if you do the Dodson Trail, which is not as high. But so that's what we're going to be looking at right now is the high area. You could uh, white-throated swift is a spectacular bird. They nest up high. If you're in the basin, on occasion, you'll if you listen and you hear a chittering that might remind you of a purple martin uh, sound. Look up because they've come down low. You can get them in the canyons at the river sometime. Uh, if you if you watch with your binoculars up high at San Lena Canyon, you can sometimes see them. But if you watch, they will come whipping by on the trails up high and just a delightful bird to see. Audubon's warblers, we get both myrtle and Audubon's. Um, I think they should be two different species, but um, Audubon's is beautiful. And uh, flammulated owl, I have to tell you, a lot of people ask me about seeing it. You have to be in Boot Canyon for about a two-week period um, at night. So that would be a special tour. Nobody's ever asked for it. Um, it's, it's a very short window. If they don't call, you're going to miss out. But if they are, you'll get them usually. But very narrow window, and you have to stay up high at um, – uh, you know, in, in the mountains at night. And uh, I love doing it, but a lot of people are not, uh, not big fans of being out there by themselves at night or even with me. So I don't know why they'd be scared being up there at night with me. Uh, there's a spot I like to take you back in boot Canyon where I, I've, I've, if I can get people to be patient and just sit there, a lot of people want to chase birds. They think they'll see more. I promise at this location, if you'll just sit, all the birds we're looking for are going to come by and you'll get much better looks at them. So up on the left, we have the blue-throated mountain gym. I have a spot where anywhere from three to four of them will just chase each other constantly, perch right in front of you, get some really good views. Um, it, it's, it's, it's as easy to do if you just sit your butt on these rocks with me because you got a long hike back down, and I tell them, just stay right here, and you'll see them. Down on the lower left, the painted red starts, which are obviously a beautiful bird. Uh, shame we have to go up so high for people to enjoy them, but uh, always a delight uh, when they're there. Near When you get near Pinnacles Pass, that's a really good spot for zone-tailed hawk to come overhead. Um, they nest sometimes over on uh, Thule Mountain, and uh, they'll, so they'll soar right in that gap. This is a really good spot. Uh, which bird do you need, Patricia? Put that in the comments for me. Um, the zone-tailed hawk is a really good one up there. Uh, you know, springtime, early summer, uh, man, I see it most trips up, uh, but you I tell you, even if you're down in the basin, do not assume it's a turkey vulture. You need to be checking all the vultures 
Um, and, and I've had these soaring in flocks of turkey vultures in the basin. Uh, so we get dusky cat flycatcher. This past year, I actually had them in, a, in an area. I had not had them regularly where they were out in the open, a little easier to see. They're often in a steep part of the trail on Pinnacles Pass, and getting a look at them can be tough. Hearing them uh, can be fairly easy, but I uh, had them right along um, a real good part of the trail last year. White-breasted nuthatches are up high in, in the, uh, and the habitat is very different up high. We have several species of trees that are remnant populations. There's even a little tiny patch of aspen trees right up against, I believe it's the south face of, um, uh, of uh, Emory Peak, the highest point in the park. On the right is, a, is the uh, slate-throated red stark that was up there last year. Stayed much of the year. There was actually a female for a little bit. Um, some friends of mine and I got to see it going into a, a, a cavity for nesting. Got very excited. Next trip up, I never saw the female again after that. So that was kind of disappointing. I was really hoping to get a nesting record for that bird up there. But he stayed and sang all the way through August. I went up there several times, um, even later in the summer. And the bird was very active singing and obviously a beautiful bird, as, it, as you can see. Cordier and Flycatcher, there's a, one little spot where the uh, Boot Canyon Trail crosses the dry, now, unfortunately now most of the time, dry creek bed. But that is um, a, a pretty reliable spot for them. You know, hear their call and they move up and down the canyon. Um, oh, well, Patricia, I can get you those birds very easy on a hike up there. Uh, Black-headed grosbeak, which is just a gorgeous, I mean, um, I, know, I know the rose-breasted out there that you guys have at East is pretty, but I think the Western holds its, holds its, uh, holds its own against it. Broad-tailed hummers are, you, as you hike along the trails, it's like a broad-tailed hummingbird highway. They just buzz along. They don't tend to be very cooperative and sit for you very long. And, and blooming plants are, are often, depending on our rain levels, few and far between. So, if you find a good one that they're forging, forging at, you sit there, you might watch them, but man, you will hear them and, and they'll be buzzing by you close all the time. So uh, yeah, absolutely, Patricia, I can I can get you up there. Uh, oops, let's see if my slideshow is gonna, there we go. And there's the bird that everybody wants to go for. Not the prettiest of the warblers, but it is the coolest warblers because it is such a limited range. It is such a unique experience to get to go see it. If you see this bird, uh, let me say this. I have not missed showing someone the bird yet. Um, I, I have had a few people I didn't think I was going to get off the mountain, but they still got to see the bird. Uh, if you'll go to my spot and sit down and be patient, we often get very, very close images of this bird. I got so excited. We wanted to find a nest for the film. Found a nest within like you know 15 feet of a trail. And within a week, it got predated. Uh, you know, there were no eggshells left, so it wasn't a mammal. Uh, I would pretty much assume it was a, a snake, given that the shells were completely gone. You know, a jay could have carried them off, but uh, the bird really nest uh, close to the trail, and we didn't get much footage. In fact, he only shot one day and didn't get anything close. I found another nest, but it was way a very steep slope, way up under a tree, and you just you wouldn't see in the nest or anything. But uh, they are ground nesters. It's very hard to find the nest the uh the, the males and females you know they, they look alike and uh they're very active foragers but they will come down low so we we often get to see um this is the kalima patty this is the kalima um you, we often get very good looks just being patient getting me let me get you to the right spot sit down we'll eat some lunch you'll drink some water I promise you're going to get our generally, generally a really good view of these guys if we just be patient in that one area uh, up in Boot Canyon. So let me see if my slideshow. So that that wraps it up for the high elevation. We get other really cool birds up there, cool mammals. I get bear, you know, fairly regularly. Uh, I've only had three mountain lion in 30 years. That's tough. There's a very rare lizard. I'll talk about some of these other things later. But dugout whales. I have some great news. If any of you have birded out there in the past few years, you know the the, the windmill was not working. Uh, it had stopped working. Many of the cottonwood trees died. They'd been cut down, which was some of the great nesting for Western screech owl, elf owl, yada, yada. The, the Kalima, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the windmill is working and creating water, uh, putting water out. Vegetation's going to come back. Uh, it, it's going to be great for the wildlife. 
I think this is going to help greatly with what the, turning dugout wells back into the hot spot it once was. Wayne Fisher asked, how hard is the Kalima hike? Uh, I, I can tell you if you're in fairly decent walking condition, what I do is I start at least an hour and a half, at least before sunrise. So you'll wear a headlamp, carry a flashlight. We don't spend a lot of time birding on the way ups. If we make it in the average amount of time that most of my clients can do it, you will be near the pass before the sun is really on you much. And it's often very cool in the morning. Pinnacles is steeper, but it's in the shade longer than Laguna Meadows going up. In Laguna Meadows, I just never have nearly as many birds over there as I do on Pinnacles. But we don't really bird much going up till we get really near the top. Uh, so, Because so, we want to get up high and have plenty of time. When you do the switchbacks, you know, we'll stop and take a blow as people need it. It's always fine. If you will have a camel pack or a mule pack with water and sip the whole way, you'll do much better. You'll do much better. Good shoes are really critical. And, uh, you know, I've taken a 94-year-old woman from Colorado. She lived in Colorado, high elevation, hiked all the time. I've had 20-something struggle. The elevation gain, the first two and a half miles is about 1,700 feet. But uh, it really, I promise you, guys, I did it at, I did it at, a, I was heavy set. I've been losing weight. I did it last year, 14 times in April with one time was backpacking with 40 X, 40 pounds of 32 pounds of water. Plus my gear. If you take your time, what it is, is coming down will often hurt your feet. So I tell people, you know, really good shoes, really good socks, not ones you just bought, but, but ones you're used to walking in drinking plenty of water and taking our time. Most people can do it unless you just really never exercise, you know, never out walking, then, then you might struggle. But the reality is, is that I've not had a client yet who quit going up and I've had some fairly heavy set folks make the hike. Um, I had one gentleman I had to help down about the last mile and a half. His feet were hurting so bad that every step down, I had to kind of hold his hand, which I was more than willing to do. Uh, but the reality is, is most people can make it. And uh, and if someone decides to start going up and they can't, we'll finish birding the whole rest of the day and see some other cool stuff. So, uh, And you might always say we can always try Pine Canyon, which is much more gradual, but not as guaranteed to see the bird. Okay. So let me go back to how many hours does it take? Generally, if I leave an hour and a half before sunrise, we usually are back in the parking lot between 430 and 6 p.m., depending on how fast my client can come back down. On my own, I can make it down in an hour and a half. I hoof it uh, because the birding usually in the afternoon on that part is a lot slower. But with clients, it's generally two and a half, three hours coming down, taking our time. How many miles up and back? Generally, a 10-mile round trip hike to get to the really good spot for seeing Kalimas and the blue-throated mountain gyms. The actual uphill hike, I always hope to have people – Near the pass between 8.45 and 9, 9 a.m. Uh, that's generally when I hope to have them by there. Okay. So I'll keep looking for any more questions about that. But uh, I promise you guys, I've had I've taken lots of people, 70 plus, up that, up that trail. Lots of water, taking our time, take all the breaks we need. It's not a, it's not a, uh, Yes, they will still be singing in May. May is a great time, Peter. I love, I love Big Bend in May. Great time. Everybody wants to come in April. In fact, let me tell you, I only have about four days open for April 2021. Everybody wants to come in April. May is a great time. You have some species have already migrated through, but the key things that we're going to we, that you want to see that are resident are still there. Okay, so do not hesitate to book in May. Uh, we start early. It can get a little warmer in the afternoons, but you're coming down anyways, and it's very shady on that trail coming down. A little secret, when I came out, before I lived out here, Memorial Day was my one of my favorite times. I would come on Memorial Day that Monday when everybody was going home. Shh, that's a great time because very few people are in the park. Um, Monday of Memorial Day, let everybody else go home. You come out, okay? So we'll jump back to dugout wells, but I'll keep watching for any more questions you folks may have. Uh, Doug at Wells is this little, uh, little spot right here. It's a, it's a gravel road. You can get a Toyota Prius, uh, down that road. Yes, Kathy, the Klimas are there in summer. Uh, when they stop singing, it's a little tougher, but I still find them. I haven't struck out yet, uh, in June, July, or August. That is a warmer time. I will take you up. 
you do need to be in a little better shape because that's where I, I had one older client who was not, his feet were hurting. And so I, that one, if June, July, and August, I love going up because August is post breeding dispersal. You'll find some cool stuff, but I, that one, I would say, Hey, I want you to make sure you're in a little better condition. So dugout wells right here, man, dragonflies, butterflies. Now that the water's flowing, it's going to be so good again for this stuff. You see a lot of javelina there when the water was flowing and with the windmill being repaired, it is going to be a very good spot. Uh, it, it's been a good spot. We had a long eared owl there just, I think two winters ago. So it's, it's a good spot, but it's going to get even better. Uh, let's see if my slide will advance here. What's the highest elevation that you hike? Uh, we generally get around mm, 6,700 feet, somewhere in that range, some 6,700 feet in elevation. You start at about 5,100. Um, okay, so Dugout Wells, ash-throated flycatcher, very similar looking to Dusky Cat, very different call. Uh, but ash-throated, you know, they just got back here in the last week, been calling. I've got one back here behind the house. Uh, really fun southwestern uh, bird species. Wintertime, Brewer Sparrow. There's a little spot where puddles uh, go that right now, to the park is closed right now. And right now I know there are toads singing in those uh, puddles. But Brewer Sparrow, that's a really good spot for them. They come in there in larger flocks um, there in winter. And lark bunnings are often found in that area. You know, they stay in the low areas and often be anywhere in flocks from, you know, eight to, I've seen up to 80 or 90 birds in one flock out there. You know, I'm going to take a, a sip of, uh, ooh, I don't have much. Today's uh, presentation on Big Bend National Park was not brought to you by Diet 7-Up, but mm, that was that sad, wet, um, dry drink at the end there. Ah, oh, my mouse is not being very kind to me. Loggerhead shrikes. A lot of people are surprised to see loggerhead shrikes down here basically year-round and um, voracious. Oh, I took a picture the other day of a round-tailed horn lizard's head. That was all that was left of it impaled on a barbed wire fence. Beautiful shot, as long as you're not the round-tailed horn lizard, uh, which is a different species than our horny toad that everybody calls. That's Texas horn lizard. Butcher birds. Um, yep, yep, shrikes are awesome, man. Little, Thank God they're not three or four feet tall. We would all be screwed. Um, and be, we'd all be stuck on a barbed wire fence. Common night hawks, you get lesser night hawks down low at night on the roads, common poor wheels, but really good spot to try and, and uh, see some of the uh, night jars that we have out here. Uh, on the upper left is a young Western screech owl. Uh, it was pitch black. I was sitting at a picnic table there with my wife, uh, hoping some elf owls would start calling. And we're sitting there and it's just dark as all get out. And I said, oh man, there's an owl in that tree. And my wife is like, there's, how do you know it wasn't calling? I said, how do you know? Said, how do you know it's pitch black? Well, my eyes have gotten a little just, I said, because it doesn't look like a branch. And it was probably 25, 30 feet from us. And she goes, there is no way there's an owl in that tree. I go, Mel, there's an owl right there. So I grab my camera my, and, and, and flashlight, focus, take a picture, turn to her, go, there's the owl. She's like, oh my gosh. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't look like a limb. That's how you see owls if they're not calling. Of course, curb build thrashers. Uh, we get uh, Vesper Sparrow and Scaled Quail. Oh, Scaled Quail, just so beautiful. Such an incredible. I love hearing their little jerk calls as they run around the desert floor out there. Uh, Daniel's Ranch. So there's this, when, when you come to a tea at Rio Grande Village, if you go right and go all the way to the end is Daniel's Ranch. A farmer lived there. He farmed that floodplain back when the mighty uh, Rio Grande River had enough water in it to actually change course and flood. And so very fertile soil regularly, and, and all these cottonwood trees are here, which is a bounty for bird watchers throughout much of the year. Uh, we had a tropical perula there, um, I think it was last summer, uh, late late spring, early summer, that was hanging out down here. I love Daniel's Ranch. You can actually get down to the river. There's Hot Springs Canyon, so zone-tailed hawk, common blackhawks forage along the river. Lots of swallows, swifts, white-throated swifts come down. Beautiful spot. Bobcat, right in this area, this is one of the better spots for bobcats. And so you see right down here, it says Rio Grande Village. And here is Daniel's Ranch, okay? So this is the side of Rio Grande Village we're going to be on. And we're going to look the other side here in a minute. But right down here on the west side of Rio Grande Village is where we're at, right on the Rio Grande River with riparian habitat. Yellow throats, as we all know, are more often heard than seen, but in the cane along the river, 
Uh, we've got common ground dove. Uh, they'll call along the river, nest down along the river. Uh, they're getting fewer. I hear less and less at times, unfortunately. Uh, we had a fire that took out some of their habitat over near Cottonwood Campground, but hopefully they'll hang on their beautiful little birds. Lark sparrows often in the area and down along the river. Uh, you know, we get northern rough winged swallows uh, flying along. Probably one of the more common of the swallows that we see even during migration, you know, and when other swallows are coming through a little more, I'd say they're the more common I see. By the way, if you're trying to look on eBird and see my reports, I don't eBird. I don't want to be looking at my phone when I'm out. I don't want to come home at 11 o'clock at night and then sit down doing an eBirds list. I know I'm terrible. If you want to know what I'm seeing, uh, we have a Facebook group called Transpecus Birds and Birding. And if I see something great there, you may email me, call me, text me, or you see anything cool. I'm happy to share. Uh, you can look at my, my recent picture posts. I, I don't eat bird. I'm sorry. I know. I know. At least you can't shoot me through the computer. We get Swainson's hawks, you know, in the lower areas of the park. And yellow-headed blackbirds uh, migrating through the park are always fun to see, particularly down along the river. Between the Rio Grande Village store and Daniel's Ranch is a very well-known common Blackhawk nesting site. One of the best spots to actually get to observe the Blackhawk behavior. I find I'm often down there by myself because I love summertime. It does get warmer at the river. There's a little more humidity. But I tell you what, some of my most incredible experiences come in July and August. Common Blackhawks are reptile, amphibian, and insect specialists. So to watch them bring different, you know, reptilian and amphibian prey and insects, the grass was a little taller one year and there were cicadas all over the grass. The Blackhawks were flying at me, coming so close to me. You have to stand behind the sign. I'm up, I'm up on this berm that you see. They're flying so close towards me. I can only photograph the head. They're walking around, plucking cicadas off of grass and flying back up to the nest. I took over 1,700 images that day, and that evening, like an idiot, I inadvertently deleted all of them. I actually had wet tears on my face uh, from doing that. It was an incredible day. I get other great days like that, though, with some really neat predator-prey interaction. Here on the left, uh, you see the, the adult with uh, a, a recently fledged young. That is a spiny, soft-shelled turtle, a young one, and uh, the at first, the adult gave it to the young one. The young one could not pull the turtle apart. So the, the adult took it back, tore it up into smaller pieces, which, you know, poor little turtle. But it was, a, I mean, to, to think about it, even a young turtle, it tore apart the carapace and fed it. And a client and I probably captured over a thousand images of this feeding behavior. Um, so don't be afraid of summer. Uh, there's a beautiful shot of one of the adults perched out on a branch out there. Another one from the rear. In case you can't tell, this is one of my favorite birds in the park. They're beautiful. They mimic the common black. I'm sorry. They, they mimic black vultures. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you see black vultures circling down in the area, you always got to look and check, make sure it doesn't have a white band on the tail or yellow sear or long yellow feet. Rio Grande Village. Now we're over on the east side of Rio Grande Village. This is the campground. What you see below you is what used to be a much better beaver pond. The beavers have moved on, and so they no longer maintain the pond as well. So a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, cattail and whatnot, vegetative plants have taken hold and begun to fill it in. It's not as good for open water birds as it once was. But um, you'll see this old boardwalk. I'm standing on the overlook, which... You, it, for birding, you only need to go up on the overlook if you really want to see rock wren or maybe raptors or something or to look up and down the river. There's not very many birds up on the overlook itself. But you see this boardwalk right here, okay? Uh, and here's the campground. And, and walking the edge of the habitat is always very productive uh, along here and through the campground. This trail... Uh, there's a dead stump. You can sort of make it out in the picture right here. I flushed a barn out off that stump the other day. Along the boardwalk, particularly in winter, Virginia's rail, Sora, Swamp Sparrow, Marsh Wren, uh, um, I think those are the main ones. And occasionally, they don't stay very long, the, uh, the um, green kingfisher will be seen 
uh, often along these reeds. You, if you hear the little tick, tick, tick sound, keep an eye out for it. Uh, other birds will perch, say Phoebes, black Phoebes come over. When it was open water, you'll see some of my pictures of the other birds um, that, that frequent the area. They should bring the beaver back. The beavers are still in the park. Uh, they we have, we have some in, uh, in San Elena Canyon. You have a very narrow window during the day to see them. Uh, but I will say, if you watch the have this TV special I've been helping with, you'll get to see some footage of them. They are in other places along the river. They just moved on from the pond. Um, you know, and again, this area we're at is on this side of Rio Grande Village. Okay. Boy, the golden fronted woodpecker. I mean, I love these guys. I never get tired of showing them out. And notice in this picture, the golden front, you know, his little boxers are hanging out there. Uh, American kestrels, I often have them um, perched up on the cottonwoods uh, down there sometimes. And the great thing about the campgrounds are the roadrunners get so used to people that they'll walk within a few feet of you. And uh, I think my record so far is 16 roadrunners in a day. And that is a, uh, a beautiful bird. And it would be, it should be the state bird of Texas instead of the boring mockingbird. But that's my opinion. Uh, occasionally, Mississippi kites stop down at Rio Grande Village during migration. I came across this one one evening sitting up on top of one of the dead cottonwoods. And some, sometimes on the pond, you'll find a few a few waterfowl, not as much as you used to, but green winged teal. We used to have you know blue winged teal. There's a cinnamon teal at the back. I really miss when the pond was a little more open, brought in a few more birds. Sometimes the ducks are there, but they're on the backside and you can't really see them there. Is what it is, right? Um, black-tailed gnat catcher, which, oh, again, I, I don't know what it is about birds that are black, white, and gray. They're very dapper to me, and I'm not a big fancy dresser. All my friends will tell you that. But I love crisp black, white, and gray plumages, and this bird is that way. And uh, when you hear them, you know, flirting around in the in the underbrush, it's always fun. Sora, this, that shot of a sore is actually taken from there. So trying to get a good open view of them every now and then. Golden crowned warbler. Well, that's a very rare bird. Um, that's that's a that's a. You, you might already think about the Kalima warbler. Might be thinking about Kalima warblers, and they do nest in Mexico. But uh, oh, golden cheek. Nah, nah, golden cheek. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not as big a warbler guy as a lot of other guys are, unless it's Kalima. Uh, black chinned hummers, much more common down in the low areas. Um, you know, you can get them up in the mountains, but a little more common down below. And right at the entrance to the trail is a really good hot spot for finding rarities. Um, you know, we've had black throated gray uh, is often found there. I don't think we had one this winter. This is a group built Ani that had stayed for a few days. But right at the head of the nature trail, uh, I mean, I had two uh, white throated sparrows, which is a fairly unusual sparrow out here um, at that area. So uh, swamp sparrows, lots of my favorite birds hang out in this area. Uh, we get both Western and Eastern bluebirds. Eastern bluebirds have nested uh, in Rio Grande Village campground now uh, last few years. And, uh, you know, been watching the young here recently. And then painted bunnies are often singing on the road between Rio Grande Village store and Daniel's Ranch in April of one year. I had over 30 painted bunnies, males in one open area foraging. That was a pretty cool sight to see. So let's talk about Sam Nell Ranch. Uh, when I when I first my first trip to Big Ben, I took my new camera and like the third bird I ever tried to identify was a, was a, uh, um, um, good grief, Lee, the very bunting. And I took a picture of a male and it took me forever to, because it was slide film. I didn't get it developed immediately. It took me forever to finally figure out what that was. But my third bird of my life list is a, is a very bunting, which I had and, and often have here at Sam Nell Ranch. This is an old ranch headquarters. This has two windmills. One is clearly not working anymore. And one down low where all the trees are is working. And if there's the tiniest amount of wind, it will generate a puddle. Let me let you in on a little, another little May secret. I will often be the only person down there at May. I take a chair. I sit within about 8, 10 feet of that little drip. And one year I had several, and you'll see some pictures of them, some of like the second or third record of Eastern Warblers in the park, sat there for a day and a half migration, just blowing and going out here while everybody else is butt cheek to butt cheek at High Island griping at each other. I'm by myself getting to enjoy a lot of the same birds. So 
Sam Nail is a great spot to take a chair, take a drink, and sit there. I had other critters come up to the drip while I was sitting there, including snakes and lizards and skunks and javelina and whatnot. Sam Nail Ranch is right here. I actually had a client that was a uh, grandchild, I think, of Sam Nail. That was kind of cool. They filled me in on some of the history of the site. That was really interesting. There is a varied bunting. That's not the one I took a picture of. It was not nearly as good. And I don't know, man, that's a beautiful bird too. That would make a nice state bird. I, I, I never get tired of seeing varied buntings. Sage thrashers in winter. That's a wintertime bird down here. And, and it seems like if we have them, we have a lot of them. And if we don't, we don't hardly have any reported at all. Guadalupe National Park, I had 30 within a short hike to Smith Spring and back one day up there. And um, so you can have them in really heavy numbers out here. Ladderbacked woodpecker, the Verdon, such a cool southwestern bird. I love that gorgeous head and love listening for them and trying to get everybody a good look. Phanopeplas, and I'm going to tell you now, Phanopeplas are much easier in the Davis Mountains up here than they are in Big Bend. We do have them. Uh, there is the town I used to live in in Sanderson. They're much easier uh, even than in Big Bend National Park. And uh, that's a great spot to look for Phanopeplas. But that red eye, that black bird, oh, man, that'd be a great state bird too. I love that guy. So this is the, all these migrants. This is one day at Sam Nail. Okay. Uh, and as you can see, I had some really nice migrants stopping through. Had Black Burnian, Virginia's Warbler, Western Tanager. So you get this mix of Eastern and Western birds coming through. And I want to say, uh, golly, I want to say the Prairie was second, third record, maybe. Uh, Wilson's Warbler, Townsend's Warbler, all there down at the same day. Black throated Sparrow. Oh my gosh, if that's not just a spectacularly beautiful bird. If you don't like sparrows, there's something wrong with you. I love sparrows. They're gorgeous. These guys are beautiful. And of course, Pearloxia. And I don't care what people say. I like Pearloxia much better than Cardinals, even though they're much harder to spell. So anytime a Pearloxia gives me a good view, I'm going to photograph those beautiful birds. Best way I tell everybody, if they, from a distance, a lot of times people think they're female Cardinals. The Coleman is bent. On a cardinal, the Coleman is straight. The top knot's a little longer. The red is limited to certain areas, but sometimes from a distance, it can be a little hard tail. The bill is paler, different color. So, uh-oh. I don't know how that got in there. Oops. Oh, I have to go load up the second part because our web, our uh, software only allows a certain amount of uh, data. What time of year was that when you saw the Virginia's Warbler? That was... Tuesday, June 1st, after Memorial Day, on my little secret time of year when I like to get there. I think it was June 1st. Might have been, you know how Memorial Day varies. Could have been May 30th or something like that as well. So um, late May, we had a unique weather event that blew a lot of eastern warblers over. Everybody wants to come in early April. There are a lot of migrants that aren't here yet in early April. There are some. Varied bunnings, much tougher um, in early April. In fact, don't usually get it. I don't remember the exact arrival date. Cecilia might be able to throw that up in the comments for you. Um, but, man, I, I don't get varied bunnings and things like that early on. Everybody wants to come in, but do not be afraid of a little later in the year, okay? Cottonwood Campground and the Gray Hawk. No surprise, one of my favorite beautios because of that gray, white, and black pume. Uh, plumage and hearing them call down there is is just incredible come on software let's get to the next slide for me all right uh cottonwood campground this is the ross maxwell scenic whoops oh i gotta turn draw my my drawing board went off okay uh, this is the ross maxwell scenic drive this is my second favorite road in texas right here that goes down to san Elena. cottonwood campground is right here on the rio grande river okay Yep. Yeah, thank you, Cecilia. May 15th uh, is an excellent time for, for migrants down here. Uh, uh, brown crested flycatchers uh, are often over at Cottonwood, um, sometimes over at Daniel's Ranch. But you really got to pay attention to the bill size and uh, if they're calling, whatnot. But, and then everybody's favorite, man, vermilion flycatcher. Uh, you will see some incredible footage of vermilion flycatchers in the TV show and uh, you know, spring, summertime, have eight or nine, you know, different birds flying around down there. It's really, really a hot spot. Great horned owls are, uh, the male often stays in the campground. The female normally is not hanging around. 
man, if you camp down there at that time of year, you can see he has killed roadrunners, skunks. I mean, he's Cooper's hawks. Um, really a great, a great, great spot for finding him. I find him about 70% of the time in the campground down there by looking in the tall cottonwoods. You'll often find him. This time he was sitting low in the mesquites, so I was actually able to get a fairly decent picture. Wilson's warblers hanging around. This Bell's Vireo nest I actually saved from being cut down from park employees. People had actually complained about branches scratching their RVs. And so the park employees, you know, the poor guys, they're just maintenance guys, show up and they start trimming trees and I go running over, whoa, 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 whoa. I'd already seen this nest of this Bell's Vireo. I said, look, this is the southwestern form of Bell's Vireo. They're not in danger, but they're threatened. Why are we cutting trees in spring? Well, people were complaining about their RVs getting scratched. Well, if you're worried about your RV getting scratched, Big Ben may not be the best spot because something's probably going to get scratched. Might be you, might be the RV in Big Ben. It's just the, the way of the world out here. Um, but beautiful little bird. Probably the most heard, least seen ratio bird out here. Crystal Thrasher is both very hard to hear and very hard to generally get a good look at. So generally my clients, by the time I get them on it, they don't sit still very long. They get the look of the crystal going back down. So. Blue grosbeaks are all over out in this area, pretty common. You know, we get McGill of Ray's warblers moving through. And then one of the specialty birds. If Lucy's is on your list, I really like being down there earlier in the morning, April, May, you know, sometimes June. And, and that's our best shot. They'll often sit up on top of mesquite trees and sing. There's another little area they like to sing in and uh, can usually, uh, if we're patient, find a good view of. But, you know, beautiful. I love that little chestnut rump and cap uh, that you see on those birds. Well, of course, we get we get a couple of different king birds down there. We get western. Um, you'll get a Cassins in migration stopping down there. They don't stay. And, uh, yeah, lower green gulch is a great spot for the nesting crystal thrasher. you got to spend some time. There's a few pullouts uh, that you got to spend some time on and just, and again, being patient. You'll eventually hear the song if you're there at the right time of year. And, uh, and even in winter, sometimes they'll pop up. But if you're just driving along the road, uh, it, it makes it a lot harder to try to get a good look at them. Yeah, guys, and Cecilia, please throw up things like that for the folks out here. Because on the recording, the chat will be shown in the recording. So that helps a lot. Um, you know, we get brown, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, bronze cowbirds, the gray hawks. Last year, I believe it was, the gray hawks did not nest in the, in the campground. It made it a lot harder. They were in an area that I just generally don't have time to take people to on a half day or even a full day tour. Santa Elena Canyon, Terlingua Bajo. Terlingua Bajo is if you can't find the gray hawks there, you can go look over at Terlingua Bajo. It's a little walk from a campground. That's a self-portrait at night because I look much better in the dark than I do during the, the, the light. 1,700-foot cliffs on either side. Mexico on the left, America on the right there, and nothing like hearing the descending call of a canyon wren here, having a peregrine falcon come whipping down out of the canyon, or the, the white-throated swifts, zone-tailed hawks soaring overhead, swallows, uh, there's tobacco trees, you know, so we have the death march to see the Kalima warbler, we have the windmills that provide water for Samnell Ranch and, um, and, um, for the other hot spot, um, it'll come to me here in a minute. Starts with a D. Dugout Wells. Look at that. Don't worry, folks. I am a professional. Um, and so the windmills. Well, here's the other one, tobacco trees. Tobacco trees in the basin. If you hike down by the septic treatment ponds, there's tobacco trees down there that uh, Lucifer's hummingbirds and other hummingbirds come to. And then tobacco trees over here uh, along the river can provide some um, foraging for the hummingbirds here. So this is a great spot to bird and just a spectacular scenic spot. Many people drive down and they stop the overlook. You need to drive past the overlook all the way down the road to the canyon itself, a short hike out, and you will be standing at the base of the canyon. There is a little hike that goes up the side, which is spectacular because you can see all the way back to the Chisos. You do need to take shoes that may you, you know, they may get wet or muddy depending on how much water is in Trilingua Creek that flows into the Rio Grande ri River right there. So do keep that in mind. Checking on our time just to make sure we're doing well. Canyon Wren, I, I told you I'm not a huge birder by ear, but I could listen to Canyon Wrens all day long. The Black Phoebe, one of the first birds I saw when I started birding, and it just 
it just captured me with that beautiful crisp plumage. And peregrine falcons, this is a shot from a peregrine coming out of the canyon overhead. Most people don't know, but a lot of the peregrine falcons in the U.S. were restored by the by eggs taken from Big Bend birds because they had never been exposed to DDT. So it's that's kind of a unique little fact about a lot of the peregrines out here in Big Bend. Says Phoebe on the upper left. Uh, we got a rock wren uh, on the lower left. That long bill, they hop along the ground, use that long bill to pro pull insects out of crevices. If you can ever find their nest, it's really cool looking. They lay pebbles. It's like they have a little deck. They have all these little pebbles and stuff that line the entrance going into the nest. Common raven, uh, this guy had landed on a blooming century plant. If you come in May and June, July, August, and you can find a blooming century plant, that provides as much forage and food for a wider variety of wildlife than almost any other plant in the park. You will see hummingbirds. You will see gobs of insects, bats. Great spot to sit at night and with a flashlight kind of watch and, and get bats foraging. You see a raven up here foraging on the insects are attracted. Ringtails, fox, dove. I mean, I can go on and on and on the number of animals that, that this and insects that this plant provides food and habitat for they uh, in, in these stalks woodpeckers will will drill cavities for nesting and then elf owls move in so my goodness if you find an old stalk still standing with a hole in it that's a spot to look for and listen later at night for elf owls oh and the spotted sandpiper up the top sorry pine spring trails uh, I don't get many clients to go back here. It's a little bit of a rough road, getting, but not that bad. I mean, I'm, I live on a rough road, but it's really not that bad. And I wish more people would choose this as a destination, particularly in late August. Yes, it'll be warmer, but this is where a lot of Mexican rarities can be found in late August. Um, I'm often doing a lot of landscape photography then too, but if someone contacts me, I'll be more than happy to go bird Pine Springs. I bought an RV that I can take off road just so I can get back in here more often. So this is a really beautiful spot. You're going to see some spectacular footage from back here. Uh, if you want to see bear, this is one of the better spots to go see bear. Uh, of course we have a spotted towhee, which is uh, a one of the, uh, just a gorgeous bird. I know people see him in a lot of areas, but I mean, if you get tired of that red eye, that black hood, man, just a gorgeous bird. Bantail pigeon, I get up high on the Klima hike, but you also can get them back here in the back at Pine Springs. Uh, more very, very, I put these pictures in here again of the very bunting. Uh, if when you can identify a female very bunting, everybody gets very impressed because A, most people don't even know what they are, and, and B, they truly are probably one of the more of just the as brown as brown can be. But I love seeing them because it's so unique and so different from the male. And then, of course, there's the beautiful, um, the beautiful Lucifer's hummingbird. And I saw several po folks posting about Carolyn's place in the Christmas Mountain Oasis. And it just so happens that my wife and I are buying a business in Terlingua Ranch called Big Ben Glamping, uh, where we'll provide an off-grid campground that is just a few miles from Carolyn's. I also hope to put up some feeders and hopefully get some cool birds coming to, my, to come into this campground. So if you want to come out and see these, her road just got improved. It's still got some rough spots, but I do take uh, folks over there uh, for birding tours as well. So, and I love her place year round, man. There's great birds there much of the year. Uh, let's talk about some of the other activities though, that you can do while you're in Big Bend. Javelinas. I have a little uh, herd of eight now, javelinas that come into my yard every night and, and in the morning. If you ever want to photograph them, I do photography tours up here. You can get very close. Uh, I have most of them named. Uh, there's Javi. He's the male who got driven out by Scaredy Cat. There's there's uh, Pumpkin and, uh, and there's uh, Carol Baskins now. So I've got all these cool names for all the different ones. That mountain line is a uh, mountain line I saw on the window pour off trail. By look, looking back, you will see a lot of wildlife in Big Bend because if you just look ahead, you're going to miss angles. I turned around and this guy, lady, this was actually a big female, was sitting on this boulder 12 feet up. Crushed granite is the base there. And when she jumped off this 12 foot boulder, we didn't hear a sound. I said, that's the last sound a deer never hears right there. Badgers in the low areas at night. Badgers are common out here, but they're harder to see than you would expect. So you got to keep your eyes open. And oh my gosh, the Mexican black bears. 
uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, we have black bears up here, but you don't have the Mexican race of black bear. They came back into the park just before my first trip to the park ever. Summertime is great. Nobody's hardly on the Lost Mine Trail. I took the picture. There were three cubs. These are two of them. I took, I, I photographed a, a, a sow with three cubs for over an hour and a half. I was standing in the parking lot at Lost Mine Trail because nobody was there. It was great until a tourist with an iPhone drove up and tried to get out and walk up to them with an iPhone. So I educated him about trying to do that kind of thing. The little deer there is the Carmen white-tailed deer, a subspecies of white-tailed deer. Uh, little bitty, I mean, we're talking like the size of dogs. The, the fawns are so small. Last year, I didn't get to see it, but a client did. One of the gray foxes actually killed uh, one of the fawns. That's how small they are. Black-tailed jackrabbit. Uh, one of one of the really cool animals down low. And that striped skunk came up while I was sitting in the chair at that migrant hotspot to get a drink. Probably six feet from me. He didn't care. He was thirsty. We have hooded, which is impossible to tell apart from striped. And we have hog nosed, which is very cool looking uh, skunk. They're a little easier to see around Sanderson and Langtree. And then we have Western Spotted, which I have a game cam picture of one in my yard up here. And that is the only evidence of one I've ever seen. I haven't seen roadkill. Crevice spiny lizards are very common uh, in rocky areas up high. I've had a crevice spiny on the top of Emory Peak at 55 degrees, and I thought, you have the coolest place to live of anybody. That's the Texas, Texas antelope squirrel. There's a little spot on the road right near the lodge restaurant. I never see anybody else stop there to look, but I often have uh, an adult with some young ones right over there. I love venomous snakes. I keep venomous snakes. I've seen people swerve to hit them in the national park. It is a national park. It is their home. Please do your best. Do the speed limit. Do your best to avoid the snakes and wildlife on the road. This is their home. That's a Western Diamondback. If you get to see one, you're very lucky. Stop and enjoy it. There's blacktail rattlesnake, mottled rock rattlesnake, uh, Mojave rattlesnake in some areas in the lowlands. So we have quite a few different species of snakes in the park. Of course, there's the night sky. If you bird hard all day, though, it's kind of hard to stay up late at night to see the night sky, but you can see the Milky Way there in late summer was just spectacular. So night sky viewing is at its best. If you want to go explore some of the back road areas, there's a spring not far from here called Glen Spring that I really enjoy stopping to check to see what, what's there. You, you, need, uh, you, you need a pretty good high clearance at least. And to get, if you're actually going to stop at the spring, you probably would like at least four wheel high to be safe. Ernst Tanaha on the right is a short hike uh, and a really cool Tanaha. You don't want to get too close to the water. A mountain lion has been found drowning there. Deer, they can't get out once they go down for a drink, but it is a beautiful area and a really fun place to go explore. So those are some of the other activities you can do while you're in Big Bend. Let me tell you about my favorite times of year to visit the park. Mid-March, all the way through mid to late August. Later in the summer, the, the butterflies and dragonflies, insects are often better because we've had our monsoons. Monsoons come June, July, August. That's why some things can be so great. Then early March, late February, eh, I'll take you out, but it, I'll be honest, it isn't my favorite time. Uh, September can be slow or it can be okay. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of September for that reason. It's just a little risky. Then beginning in October through early February, we can get uh, some really good birds. People ask me about a lot of the raptors they see on my photography page. We have better raptors in winter up near Fort Davis. We have very few raptors in Big Bend in winter. We have more raptors in Big Bend in spring and summer because of the nesting black hawks, zone-tailed hawks, gray hawks. So if you want raptors, you either need to come do Fort Davis in winter, which I'll, I'll probably do a presentation on burning Fort Davis area here before long. Or you need to do Big Bend in late spring or summertime, okay, for raptors. Owls, you know, starting just, you know, last couple of weeks on for elf owl for a little bit. Once they stop calling, once the young have fledged, it, it, it gets a lot harder for the elf owls. Western screeches are not as numerous as they used to be for me in the park, but, you know, we do still find them. And uh, so, you know, if you want the Kalima, you don't have to stick to April. I can find them for you in April, no problem. But, but please understand, I'm almost already booked for 2021. 
It's okay. You can book me for other times. We will see the bird and we'll see some other very cool stuff. I don't normally sing the band tail pigeons up higher until a little later in the summer anyway. So for those kind of things, um, I would ask if you want to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, oh, shoot. I think my next slide will have the wild side nature tours. I thought that one had both of them. Look us up, both Wildside Nature Tours and Big Ben Birding and Photo Tours. Um, Kevin at Wildside, we want to thank him because without Wildside Nature Tours, we wouldn't be getting to have um, any of these webinars. You can click on where it says hosted by Wildside Nature Tours up there. I do international and domestic tours with Kevin. So you'll see I'm going back to the Galapagos Islands in September of 2021. I do the Yellowstone in winter uh, photography tour. Amazon Riverboat Cruise. Oh my gosh, I just got back from that. Eight species of primates. It was spectacular. Pygmy primates, the smallest in the world, and owl monkeys, which are ridiculously rare to get to see. And I got to catch and hold my first wild um, anaconda. I do Glacier National Park, Panama. We're going, I'm going to do dart frogs and birds. Out here, July, August, September, I do Capture the Hummingbird um, photography workshops in my own backyard. Raptor photography tours. So I've got a lot of items uh, that, that, uh, you may want to come out and join me for photography. I do half day, full day birding tours, wild side goes birding all over the world. Um, and, uh, we're hoping to put together a Kalima warbler tour for them. So check into it. They've got phenomenal international guides, Adrian Benz. Uh, we've got, uh, Gabriel Lugo in Puerto Rico, Alex and Chris in America are two of the most incredible birders you'll meet. So lots of opportunities to get out. If you have questions about birding Big Bend National Park, please contact me through my Facebook page. Here, let me go back to that. Or on Instagram, my email, uh, my website is Tour Big Bend. Let me type that over here. Tour, whoops, tourbigbend.com. Contact me through that. I'll help you out. Uh, I hope you've had an informative uh, time. Let's check the poll. Let's see how many people, 23 said no, never birded Big Bend. Eight, yes. Okay, that's kind of cool. Oh, I see some questions over here I didn't see. Will you provide the slides to us? This video is being recorded. It will be available on YouTube and on Big Marker, the free one. So you will get a chance to watch it again and again and again. Uh, hello from Cleveland. Uh, how will I know when the film is out? It'll be for free on PBS or BBC. There, uh, there is no title for it yet, but be watching your public broadcasting type channels for it probably summer of 2021. Recent fires in birding in Cottonwood, the, the common ground dove that used to nest right along the river there have moved on. It burned the cane. Uh, yeah, that was a good spot to look for migrants right in that little spot, but it'll grow back better, thicker, lusher, and I, I expect it'll return, but the, the campground's still awesome. How do you get in touch to schedule a day or two for guiding? Go through my website and uh, and contact me there. Uh, yeah, the wild side guides are awesome. Thank you, guys. I hope you have a good evening. I have a few more minutes for questions. I'll watch right here. But uh, if, you've, if you've got any questions or I didn't answer one, throw it up. Otherwise, I'm going to plan to stop the recording. And everyone be safe. Hopefully, we can get back outdoors and actually start seeing some birds on our own. Have a good evening, guys. I'm Lee Hoy. Hope you had fun. Bye-bye.